Have you guys uh, messed with inheritance? Anyone ever run into problems where they like hid data, anything like that? They didn't put virtual on a destructor and it never got called? So Go just doesn't have inheritance. Uh, and that seems weird. It blew my mind because I, ever since I started learning programming in seventh grade, I, I learned Java first. Uh, it was learning inheritance. Object oriented is inheritance. Go is object oriented and it doesn't have inheritance. And it took a while to, for me to wrap my head around that. What they have are interfaces. Uh, here we have an interface, which is a fighter. No one's a martial artist in here, right? Are you? So I put Krav Maga as like the most DA um, fighters. Boxers were the lowest on the list. Is that okay? Not offended? Okay. All right. Um, so here I just made a boxer, which is an int, just to show that uh, interfaces can interact with all kinds of types. It doesn't matter what the type is. All that matters in an interface is if you have a function. If this said string here after this, it said a fighter is anything that implements a fight function that returns a string. This is saying a fighter is anything that has a fight function that doesn't return anything. So I have my type boxer, and he has a fight function, which doesn't return anything. And what he does is uh, boxer's an int, so if you dereference him, you get that number, and he's just going to increment. So if a, he started a boxer off with three, he would throw four punches with this logic. Um, and MMA, an MMA fighter is a struct that just has a fighter. What's interesting about that is fighter is an interface. So it's just like a pointer. Um, so that means I could store a boxer inside of an MMA fighter, or I could store a Krav Maga inside of an MMA fighter. He can have a lot of different types. And that's called embedding. And then Krav Maga, I just show that he has an array. He has all types of styles. I probably mixed those up, huh? Oh, well. Um, so what Krav Maga does when he fights is he goes through all of his styles and he defers to them to do their fighting. So we see here, I'm going to create um, two boxers. I'm going to create an array of fighters. So one of the boxers, I'm going to make a kickboxer. I didn't show all the types I created. I created a lot. I was really bored. Um, the MMA fighter is a judoka this time, it looks like. And Krav Maga has a few different styles. And then I'm just going to say fight. And you see that there was a punch punch from the boxer, a couple kicks from the kickboxer, the wrestler grappled, the MMA fighter threw, and the Krav guy did a bunch of stuff. Um, so it's a lot like inheritance, but it's composition. And if, if you get into design patterns and a, a lot of like CS theory, they say composition over inheritance, favorite. Because you don't run into as many problems with uh, uh, using interfaces wrong or large hierarchies of code things. And why that is is because what we normally mean to do when we uh, derive from something is we normally mean to describe its behavior. But what we end up doing is we start passing state and behavior, um, data. So uh, what this is saying is you can't do that. You can only say, like, you can only pass behavior. And the implementation can be anything you want it to be. So you have to think about interfaces a lot more. But uh, it's actually pretty simple and easy. Are there any questions on that? OK. So how I use that in a game engine context is uh, I would take an like, uh, event data is anything that has a delay. So then when I'm passing data into games and stuff like that, where'd it go? I actually lost it. Here I passed a graphics component uh, into my as event data and things like that. So it, um, even though graphics component never explicitly said that I'm this type of thing, it had the right function to do it, so I could pass it as data. It, it conformed to that interface. And that's called duct typing. And I think Python lets you do that. Um, I know Ruby does and a lot of other languages, uh, mostly dynamic. Um, but yeah. Um, so in another example of that, still in the messaging system, I have a type that's an event dispatcher. And that means anything in my game, like you can be an event dispatcher in my game, if you can register for an event, if you can trigger for an event, and if you can add a listener. Um, and I just assume that like uh, when you go out of scope, you destroy all your listeners yourself. So I don't have anything explicit for that. Um, so here I have a delayed event. 
in a uh, delay dispatcher. And I'm going to embed a basic dispatcher in him. So I'm going to build, this type already conforms to the interface. So I'm just going to build more functionality on top through composition. And what that means is that when I want to use his behavior, I just say, uh, hey, talk to him and trigger the event just like he would. But it still gives me all of the, um, all of the functions. I get those functions so I still conform to the interface. It's kind of a complicated uh, one. I didn't explain it very well. But yeah, um, it's really, really powerful being able to compose behaviors through interfaces instead of through sharing data. So you just look at the behavior and you say, can you do this? And if you can, then I'll treat you like anything else. Yeah, uh, and that's pretty much it about interfaces and inheritance. Was there any questions on that? Okay. Um, so Go isn't, like Go is a great language, but there's things that it lacks. There's things that I miss from C++ programming. And one of them is easy GUI programming. Uh, Go is really good for like server side, command line tools, and even uh, web programming. But making a game app was difficult. I had to, either I had to learn OpenGL again, and it's been a few years since I've done OpenGL, or I had to use uh, like JavaScript, 3JS. There was nothing built into the language that I could use. Like in C++, DirectX is C++. So it's not that big of a departure. Um, now, there are some library projects uh, that are coming into fruition now, but they're not done yet. They're not fully mature. Macros, I said that I miss them because I really do like uh, saving some typing with macros. But then, like, right after I wrote that, I ran into this giant, like, macro bug. And I had to, like, pre-compile and uh, print out all the comments and stuff to see what was actually happening. So I don't know if I want to keep that there. I might take that one back. A fully supported IDE would be nice. I use Sublime, and it's really, really powerful. You guys saw how I could like, add includes and imports, check all my test uh, coverage and stuff there. Um, it does uh, IntelliSense kind of things for you, and you can search documentation. Uh, but it's still not the same as uh, being able to step through a debugger. There, there is a web-based GDB for Go, but it's not as uh, polished as Visual Studio is for C++, and especially for like, C Sharp and other modern languages. Unions, I think, are one of the coolest features of C++. Being able to look at a piece of data in one view, and then in the same sentence, like say, no, 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 that float, I'm going to treat it like an int right now. Uh, and that's something Go doesn't have, to my knowledge. Windows support. So Go is written by guys that are very Unixy, and how they write their tools is in a very Unixy way. So like the Go tool compiles, and it uses uh, GCC flags. So you can't even compile it with uh, CL flags. When I first started at Microsoft, I wanted to do a side project where I compiled uh, DirectX, or I rewrote DirectX in Go, just because I was like, I don't know. I just wanted to try it out. Um, but there's no way around those flag issues. Um, you'd have to rewrite the Go tool itself. And then even the debug support, Windows uses a thing called PDBs, while uh, Unix uses dwarf files mostly, and, uh, or GDB uses dwarf files. So even the debugging support isn't as fully featured on Windows as it is on other architectures. And then the other thing is I do miss not knowing about Go because it's been kind of frustrating to like have a modern language that's fully featured and then sit and wait for like a 10 minute compile on the C++ thing. Um, and like to know like, oh, the, the, the reason that this compile is taking so long is because the compiler is scanning every single line. And that's silly. You can just do it like this. Um, and then trying to tell people like, you shouldn't be waiting for that compile. We could use another tool but they've always waited for those compiles, so they don't understand that it's long. It's just part of their business. It's really, really frustrating sometimes. Um, so to wrap it up, C++ is a great and powerful language. It's, it's got a lot going on, and if you need to do everything, C++ can help you out. But it comes at a cost, and that cost is maintenance nightmare at times. And I don't know if it's always worth it to have to track down um, bugs from implicit conversions or some weird macro to find or inheritance problems. There's other languages, and it doesn't have to be Go, but it could be. There's Python, there's D, there's Rust, there's uh, Go, that are modern, that solve a lot of the problems C++ wasn't designed for. So just think about that sometimes. That's all. Um, were there any questions? OK. <laughs> yes. I do programming and go there. I don't know if I should. Um, 
So instead of using like Python, a lot of times I'll use Go. Instead of using batch scripts, I use Go. One thing that uh, was a big shock for me coming out of school, because uh, we use C++ here almost exclusively, and we might dabble in a language, was how many different languages I used uh, my first year at Microsoft. I used C Sharp, I used C++, I used Managed C++, I used Batch, I used PowerShell, I used Lua, I used JavaScript, and there's probably a few other ones I forgot. Um, the thing is, I think Go can replace a lot of those. And so I've been using Go more and more for those kind of things. Uh, so I used it for a build tool at work, uh, generating project files for something. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean manage projects? Oh, no, no, no. Um, so this or build everything for you, it knows what it's dependent on. Because uh, when you have a package, sorry, let me. You, when you include a package, it knows everything that its package includes. Because in, inside of that package, it says include this. Uh, so it builds a dependency graph all for you. So literally, just when you say build, it'll do all that for you. And that's, that was it. So one thing I do do, huh, um, I use Sublime to kind of handle the IDE side of things. Um, so like here, you see that all of my um, folders are listed here. And then I can do things like search for, I don't know, kernel run. And like it came up. So I use Sublime as my IDE. And the Go tool does all the building and stuff for you. And then I don't know if you guys have used Sublime, but it has a lot of great features in it. Um, like being able to search for a symbol like that. So a lot of things you can do in Visual Studio. But then it also has much better editor, editing features. So like I can find every instance of core and then rename it to something or make it uppercase or something. Things like that. It's really interesting. Multiple cursors are really nice. How do you select multiple lines at once? Control D or you can control click or you can, there's other keyboard shortcuts. And you can do that in a lot of editors. Um, Notepad++ plus plus, I think you can do that in. Visual Studio you can do it, but it's limited. I just, I try, I use Sublime for some of my stuff and I have a whole bunch of issues because it's always the Alt Shift D and then you use the arrow keys to select multiple lines in a majority of text editors, but it's not that in Sublime. I've never gotten it to work. I've never been able to find the proper D combination to get it to work in Sublime. Oh. Uh, like without control having to control click. Like it's control alt. I know, but Sublime is great too because you can set up multiple windows like I just did from the keyboard. Um, it's really, really easy to use and things like that. Um, there's a lot of tricks you can do. And with the Go Sublime plugin, it becomes really, really easy to write code. Um, so I code a lot faster in Go than I do in any other language because it's such a tooling-based language uh, where it formats for you, where it or vet, and tell you if you're making mistakes. Uh, because the compiler is so strict, but because of the rules are so minimal, I don't have to remember much about the language. In C++, I spend a lot of time thinking like, uh, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And I'm not really thinking about the algorithm, any algorithm anymore as long as I'm thinking about, uh, as much as I'm thinking about kind of all the gotchas in C++. Whew. Okay, that's the most I've ever talked at one time. Are there any more uh, questions on that kind of stuff? Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the resources slide? Mm -hmm. So I have like five resources slides. Uh, all right, so here's resources for learning go. Um, I don't know if these, are gonna, these slides are gonna get posted somewhere, but uh, if you send me an email, my email's at the end of this, I can just send you this. Because um, there's a lot. Um, but what's really cool is Go comes with like a tour, a step-by-step, -step, like 63-page interactive. You saw how my slides were interactive? That kind of thing, where you can type in code and it'll teach you the language. Um, there's a Go by example thing. They have code walks, which walk you like section by section through code and explain it. That's here. And then Effective Go is the single best document I've ever seen for a programming language. Um, I don't know who wrote it, but they're genius. Because uh, it's really, really simple, but it explains complex uh, things. Like all of the threading stuff, they explained it in a really, really clear, concise way. Um, resources about the Go tools, someone asked me about those. Um, this is the main one. But then profiling, covering, documenting, uh, and debugging. Threading and concurrency, there's a lot, but um, the idea that concurrency is not parallelism. So in Go, what's happening a lot of times is things aren't running at the exact same time, 
but they are running completely separately. And you're not checking on them to say, are you done yet? Are you done yet? It'll tell you when it's done. And that idea is concurrency. Um, it's just a different uh, theory of threading than uh, task-based threading. And then lastly, it's just super cool things. Like in Go, you can compile C and C++ code and run it. And you can do it right in your header file, or you can just do it from a C++ file. That's what made me want to try and compile DirectX. Um, <laughs> Table-driven testing is something that really like changed how I how I write tests, and then the design documents are a lot of them are written by the compiler writers, um, so you hear or you get to read a lot of the decisions that went into why they wrote a certain feature the way they did, or the underlyings behind the compiler. Yeah. Is that how you did the OpenGL stuff, or did you do um, the OpenGL stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but someone else did all that binding for you, so it's just a library you download. So any C library that can be compiled with like GCC, LV, LLVM. Um, I tried using uh, MinGW for Windows GCC, but it didn't work so well for me. But yeah, so any C code you can compile though. It's pretty cool. And I think that's all my resources. So anyway, thanks. Uh, here's my email address if you guys have some questions. Uh, feel free to shoot them at me. And uh, I'll try and get the slides at least posted so you guys can see the resources. Uh, and they come with interactive code samples and all that. So thanks, guys.